pioneer, a conscious pioneer, a logic general, a reason brigadier, battling a system that finds ignorance profound. Substantial evidence is all we need you to propound. Pascal's wager might seem like a reason in the you, but my wager, I bet you never meet the burden of proof. Poof, voila, it's magic, can't you see that he says some magic words and then it all just came to be Ha, more bullshit from the pulpit, meet me in the comment section and you get school, bitch More bullshit from the pulpit, meet me in the comment section and you get school, bitch The godless engineer Hello, uh, I am the Godless Engineer. Uh, tonight we are talking with Ryan Bell of um, of A Year Without God. Um, uh, just to give you a little bit of information behind Ryan here. Uh, for 19 years, Ryan uh, was a pastor, uh, most recently the senior pastor of the Hollywood uh, Seventh-day Adventist Church. Uh, in March of 2013, he resigned his position due to theological and practical differences. And uh, <clears throat> as an adjunct professor, he has taught subjects ranging from into, uh, into cultural communications to bioethics. Uh, currently, he's an educator, writer, and speaker on the topic of religion, irreligion, and humanism in America. In January of 2014, Ryan began a year-long journey exploring the limits of theism and the atheist landscape in the United States and blogged about that experience um, at, at his blog on Patheos called A Year Without God. Um, he recently uh, received a Master of Divinity degree from Andrews University in Barron Springs, uh, Michigan, and a Doctor of Ministry in uh, Missional Leadership from Fuller Theological Seminary in Pasadena, California. Um, so, Ryan, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing good. It's good to be with you. Yeah, I'm glad to have you here. Uh, you know, when I first heard about, uh, you know, you, I, I got to be honest, I didn't really hear about you until uh, after you had kind of declared that, that you had come out the other side an atheist. But I read your story and I was very intrigued by it. And so that's that's a lot of the reason why I wanted to have you come on, because you have this very unique perspective of of doing the thing that a lot of atheists say that, that religious people need to do. And that's kind of just examine, you know, the evidence behind each side and come to your own conclusion and and you have you know come to the conclusion of, of atheism and um, so uh, just to kind of start off here uh, what denomination did you grow up in like was it always Seventh-day Adventist or did you kind of bounce around a little bit well when I was uh, born and first of all thanks for having me I know we've been trying to schedule this uh, for a while and appreciate your your patience it's really great to be with you um, I, I, when I was born, my parents were Methodist. Uh, we were living in the Midwest and I remember going to church as a kid, but you know, it was just as like a, a toddler and a little, a little kid. So, um, by the time I was about seven, my parents had become seventh day Adventist and I went to church with them. So for all practical purposes, I was really raised in the seventh day Adventist church all my life and just never really, uh, considered I mean, I, I knew that there were other Christians, but I never really considered not being a Christian. It was sort of like thinking about not being who I am. I mean, it was just unthinkable. Yeah, you know, I can, I can really relate to what you're saying here because, you know, I live in North Alabama. And, uh, you know, pretty much down here, it, it's kind of like a duh thing to believe in, in God. It's like everybody just assumes that you are a Christian. And so, you know, whenever you have a differing opinion, you immediately become the subject of, of very much uh, attention and ridicule. Um, and, and so I, 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 I and, and one of the things is, is that I never considered, you know, atheism or, or just no belief to be a possibility. Um, I, I'm kind of curious, did you participate? in a lot of church activities as you were growing up? Oh, yeah. It was a big, uh, big part of my life. I remember during my high school years, I lived with my grandparents in Central California. And we had a, we were in a small mountain community. Uh, and we had a little church, maybe 50, 60 people. And we couldn't support 
one pastor ourselves. And so we shared our pastor with the church from the bigger city uh, nearby. And we only got our pastor to speak at our church about once a month. Um, and we always had these guest speakers coming in. And my grandparents were almost always the ones who would host the guest speaker at our house. Um, they always had 10, 12 people around the table on Saturday afternoons. And um, I just remember growing up just being a really theologically curious kid. I always, like I said, I, I grew up, uh, God was like air. Like I just, you know, I breathed it in without even knowing I was doing it. And, um, and so I was always curious about the cosmos, but also like the flood and dinosaurs and how did that line up? And, and I just had all these really interesting questions in my mind. Uh, and so I was always, you know, engaged with the church. I, I was part of my youth group. I preached in my little church. Uh, as I said, there wasn't uh, a pastor every week. And once or twice during my uh, youth, I spoke at the church and always got, you know, positive comments from the, the old ladies in the church. And they sort of set me on a path that I thought, like, you know, you'll be a pastor one day. So I guess I, I from a pretty young age, uh, had made church and religion a big part of my life. My family, my grandparents had morning and evening worship with us. We prayed before every meal. Um, we had Bible studies in our homes where people would come in and, and our living room was turned into a, a big Bible study. So, I mean, it was constant. I was even, I was even the president of our Young Life Club for a couple of years in high school. Well, what's, uh, <laughs> what's the, the Young Life Club? Oh, it's just a campus uh, Christian club. Um, all of the faith-based stuff happens um, uh, off campus or after school hours, so it's not like a conflict of church and state so much, at least it doesn't. It didn't seem to be back then, but uh, it was. It was voluntary, of course, and kids that wanted to get together for at lunch and talk about the Bible or whatever. So we did some uh, weekend activities, kind of like youth group, but oriented around the high school. Oh, okay. Well, uh, and I have to ask this, and I, I admit it's it's really kind of jokingly that I asked this. Did you ever consider the position that dinosaurs never existed? Um, I mean, I guess it never dawned on me that dinosaurs never existed, mostly because we have fossils <laughs> of dinosaurs. So, um, I guess always, and I, I just, as a young boy, of course, I just fascinated by dinosaurs like everybody else. Uh, so I, I just, uh, and, and honestly, like my family and my church never forced me to figure that out. They, they were never like, you have to believe that Adam and Eve were walking around in the Garden of Eden with dinosaurs. Like nobody ever like forced that opinion on me. So I, I guess in the back of my mind, I always figured there was a way to reconcile the timing of, of uh, you know, the dinosaurs and then the flood wiped them out somehow. And then, um, and then people went on after that. So which would mean that dinosaurs and people would have to have coexisted on the planet. Um, but I guess I just never, like pressed into the problems with that. Yeah. Well, the, the reason why I said that it was uh, more in a joking manner that I asked that question is because I don't know if you've heard, but there's this popular group out there now called Christians Against Dinosaurs. And uh, I, I find the fact that they, that, that they disregard, you know, evidence when it's given to them, uh, you know, uh, pretty astounding. Like, like that substantial amount of evidence uh, is pretty astounding. Um, but, um, yeah. It's one thing to not believe in God because you can't find any positive evidence. Another, it's another thing altogether to, to deny the positive evidence that you do have for something else. It's just... Well, yeah, uh, I, I don't know if you've heard the arguments coming from this particular group, but like they say that uh, archaeologists like carve and polish uh, rocks and into bones and whatnot. So, I mean, they have this whole apologetic set up for explaining why there's bones and whatnot. It, and it's, it's a big... It's a big, it's a big hoax, like the moon landing. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, getting back to to our original line of questioning uh, here, <laughs> discussion. Um, so, what made you really want to become a pastor? Um, that's a great question. I mean, I think. I mean, I I, I, I don't want to generalize about this too much, uh, but 
I, I would assume that most young people, as they're in college and they're trying to figure out what do they want to do with their life, there's one part of it that's what do I like, like what do I naturally gravitate towards. And then there's probably another part that is what do I get positive feedback from others about. Like so when I do something, other people say, wow, you're really good at that, you know. Um, or you're really good with your hands. You should be a doctor, like or a surgeon. Or you're really good with um, like mechanical things. Like you have a natural ability, and your dad would affirm that, and you would say, "Oh, maybe I want to be an engineer or something, or a mechanic, or or uh, you explain things well." So you know, maybe you think, "Oh, I should be a teacher." So I guess it was my natural interest in philosophy, and I think if I had grown up in a secular home, I probably would have majored in philosophy. Um, and I think growing up in a religious home, philosophy gets interpreted as theology. And so that was just a natural predisposition for me. Um, and then I did get a ton of affirmation. So I started, my, my subjects uh, in high school that I excelled at were math and English, actually, um, which typically are two sides of a coin. Um, you know, not often bo both are of interest to people. So I was a little confused, and I've always been a, a sort of a polymath. Like I'm not that good at everything, but I, I'm interested in everything. But um, so when I went to college, I thought, well, I like English, but nobody's going to make any money uh, teaching English. So maybe I should go into science. And so I majored. I started off majoring in physics and math. Um, actually, slightly embarrassing fact: um, I actually started off my first major in college was astrophysics um, because I wanted to be an astronaut. Um, I know that's super rare among young kids, uh, but I was the one little boy that wanted to be an astronaut. And uh, I figured I would never go into the military, partly because my religion was uh, pacifist. And so I knew that I would probably never be a pilot uh, and go into, into space as a pilot. So I figured the only other way to go into space is as a scientist. And uh, I really wanted to do that. But I very quickly uh, figured out that I was too much of a people person for the lab, and the lab kind of bored me. And so I switched to English and history and pre med and a bunch of other majors. And when I finally landed on theology, which was, the, I felt like the thing I was avoiding. Like, I kind of, I mean, I liked it. It was more like a hobby to me. Um, and the other thing, there was a negative sort of stereotype at my university where the guys, and it was almost always guys because. Uh, in our denomination, women at that point couldn't even be pastors. Um, we're still trying to figure out in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, they're trying to figure out whether uh, women can be ordained as pastors still to this day. Um, so all these young men in the theology department, um, the joke was that they, they couldn't cut it at any other occupation or any other profession or, or major. And, um, and they were also, the other joke was that they all just wanted to get married right away. Like they were super anxious to hook up with a woman and get married. So it was not super popular on campus to be a Theo major. Um, you were just kind of not very well respected. So I was avoiding it and avoiding it. I didn't want to be with those people, but I finally gave in and my family really affirmed that choice. They were so proud of me. And of course, you know, what kid doesn't want their parents to be proud of them, so. It was yeah. sort of that combination of things. Yeah. Uh, did you ever really feel a lot of pressure from your parents growing up, like as far as uh, your beliefs go or anything? I know you said that, that your parents didn't really push, uh, uh, you know, Christianity on you too hard. It was just kind of like a duh thing. But I, I, didn't, I didn't know if maybe they, you know, uh, pushed it on you like elsewhere or anything like that. No, not really. And, and I think I never really tested them about it because I just was naturally inclined you know, I, I loved theology discussions and I loved church. I mean, sometimes, you know, as a kid, I was bored with the organ music or whatever in my church. But um, I'm, I'm also kind of a natural leader. And so organizing people to accomplish things together is sort of comes naturally to me. So I thought, oh, the church, that's what church is. And I always had this, I mean, I, it sounds pretty arrogant, but as a kid in high school, I always thought, like, I could probably run this church better than this pastor. Like, it just seems like it's not this complicated. Like, it could be way better. Um, so I just had a natural – My so my parents never really needed to, like, force me in that direction. So I never really had that pressure. It was just natural for me. I just wanted to. The pressure – I guess the one little bit of pressure was in high school, because we were Seventh-day Adventists, um, 
our Sabbath, like like Jews, begins uh, Friday night and ended on Saturday night, and so I wasn't allowed to go to like dances and football games and any kind of Friday night activities. And ev everyone knows Friday night is king in high school, so um, that was a bummer. But I, I really I had internalized my faith so deeply that. I would never have articulated that my grandparents wouldn't let me do Friday night things. It was that I chose not to. Um, and there were definitely moments where I felt pretty bummed out about it. And, but it just was never a subject of debate. I think I really wanted to please my grandparents and I wanted to please God. And, and I, would, I would never have risked it. <laughs> hmm. So I guess you never really felt yourself having to force yourself to do or believe anything. You, I mean, it just kind of came naturally then. Yeah, it really did. Um, it's again like, you know, like air, or like a fish in water. It was just so natural. It's like sometimes you'll hear Christians say, like, I can't even imagine what it would be like not to have God in my life. Like, I can't even imagine not being a believer. And people genuinely believe, mean that. They mean, like, I can't imagine what my life would be like without God in it and that's exactly how I felt I mean it was just never even a question I suppose somewhere in the back of my mind I knew there were people who didn't believe in God but I never really thought about it and I never really I never thought they would be very much of a of even a large minority or anything to really worry about hmm. um, uh, uh. Sorry, I, I, I lost my, my question, <laughs> my next question that I was going right. to go with. Um, so what, what kind of made you start to uh, question uh, these beliefs that you had? Uh, you know, was there, was there any certain thing that really triggered in your mind um, about it, or, or what was that like? Yeah, I mean, the one-word answer to, to what made me start to question is really people. Um, up till I would say 1994, uh, when I was a um, graduated from high, from college, I um, I had my theology, and my theology was like nicely sealed in this container. It was it was um, tidy, and all the you know corners were nicely rounded off. It was perfect, you know, and and. Um, then when in 94 I began as a pastor and immediately met people and people are complicated and messy and they don't fit nicely into your little box that you have for them and um, so I, I immediately met people who on the one hand didn't believe exactly the things that I believed and didn't obey the rules exactly the way I thought they should and on the other hand I knew them to be good and wonderful and beautiful people so this is a contradiction, right? This is a challenge. Like, how do these really good people who I obviously love God and, and believe in God and co come to church every week but see the world differently than me, uh, felt they feel liberal to me, like they don't follow the rules the way that I think they should. So I thought, wow, they're, but they're cool people and, they're, and they give and they're generous and they're, they're forgiving and they're, they're kind to others and they have children that they care about. And, they're conscientious at their jobs. They don't cheat on their taxes. They're just good people. So I had to reconcile those things. And the challenge, I think, to reconcile those things really started to chip away at my orthodoxy, at this kind of like hermetically sealed uh, worldview that I had. Um, and just over time, I think I was just, the more my experience of the world broadened and I knew and met and experienced more people, more things about the world, traveled to other parts of the country, experienced different cultures, uh, the more my little worldview just had to stretch, right, to include all these other things. And eventually it just stretches. And I, I remember saying to a friend right before I started Year Without God, you know, my, my God box has gotten so big, in other words, my concept of God had to grow to include all these people, um, you know, other religions, you know, Jews and Muslims and non-believers even, you know, like I thought if God is love, then God's not gonna, going to hate and kill a person that tried their best to understand God and just couldn't like figure it out or couldn't bring themselves to believe it. Like God, God would have love and compassion for that person too, right? So. 
I just came to the point where my God box had gotten as big as the whole world. And then I thought, well, what's the point of the box anymore? I just have everybody is, is sort of in this together. And, and so I, I really felt like either I was going to be a universalist and just have this sort of like conception of God that, that includes everyone and everything, uh, or I'm not going to, I just can't manage to figure out whether God exists at all. And, and, and it's sort of like one of those things where, like when something becomes everything, it, be, it becomes nothing. Like when, it, when a word means everything, then the word becomes useless because it just doesn't have any specificity to it anymore. And so it's like, well, why even use that word? Because people don't even know what you're talking about when you use that word. So you have to choose a different word to be more specific. And so if God stands for everything, then, then God becomes irrelevant, really, or obsolete. And that's, I think, the gradual erosion of my theology, my belief in God, uh, to the point where it was just extra baggage. And I was working, I had to do these mental gymnastics to fit my experience of the world into this uh, idea of God that I had. And even, if, even as my idea of God was expanding, um, for instance, it came to... to um, uh, LGBT people and I had done all the backbending and everything to explain how the Bible verses that you know seem pretty obviously anti-LGBT are actually not anti-LGBT they were you know because if you understand the culture and the context and all these things uh, they're really not as anti-LGBT as we think and I'd gone through all of that and come to the place where I came all the way back around to the place where I was like no, actually, I think those verses are pretty anti-LGBT. Why am I trying so hard to say that they're not? Like, why am I doing all this? Like, you almost have to write a 50, 60-page dissertation to explain how these texts that are obviously anti-LGBT actually aren't anti. And, and then it's just, at that point, I'm like, why am I going to all this effort to explain something, which on the face of it is pretty obvious to everyone else. Um, it's easier for me just to say Paul or Leviticus or whatever was wrong about those things. And um, so that, that's kind of how it just fell apart for me. Well, um, I'm kind of curious. Um, um, looking back now, you know, from, an, from a more atheist perspective, how do you feel about those arguments that you had to construct to validate those texts? Like, do you think that they were strong um, and they just had too much work in them? Or do you think that they were particularly weak with a lot of work into them? I mean, it's somewhere in between. I mean, I think there is a lot of validity. I mean, I think, for instance, the Leviticus stuff, you know, that it's, uh, you know, if a man lies with a man, it's an abomination. Um, right after that verse, there's a verse that says, you should not look on the nakedness of a woman who's menstruating. So right after that verse is a verse that says, you know, as a husband, you should not even look at your wife's naked body while she's menstruating. Well, nobody pays any attention to that text. And of course, we all know there are other texts about stoning disobedient children and so forth. So I, I think it's easy to contextualize the Levitical material and say different time and place, different circumstances, you know, Bronze Age, tribal culture, there may have been pragmatic reasons why uh, they were anti-gay or it just seemed unnatural to them, like it just seemed gross maybe or it, it, it seemed like an abomination because uh, the biology, the plumbing wasn't, maybe they felt it wasn't meant to be used that way and, and uh, so you can kind of say like, okay, the Levitical stuff, the Old Testament stuff, yeah, I mean it's very old material that isn't interpreted literally by anybody really. When you come to the New Testament, it's a little trickier, like Paul you know, Christians take Paul pretty seriously. So to say Paul was wrong, that's a lot more challenging. Um, so a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, ink is spilled explaining that Paul was critiquing a kind of pagan temple ritual, uh, homosexual pagan uh, rituals that were done, uh, which is, is true. That was done also in the Roman culture. It was common for an older a uh, man to have a, an underage or a child or a young male concubine 
uh, sexual partner as a slave, essentially. I mean, it's very likely that those men treated those slaves very well, almost like family members, um, but nevertheless, they were that person's property and required to perform sexual uh, acts for that person. Um, and so clearly, you know, Paul would have reason to say these things are not in keeping with sort of wholesome, uh, you know, Jewish values. Um, you know, I, I think it's also true that Paul was a Jew, right? So Paul, even though we might look sideways at the Levitical material, Paul was, Paul was a Jew. He wasn't a Christian. There were no Christians. Um, so he was a reforming Jew, like he was trying to reform Judaism, and he was definitely a Jesus-believing Jew. Um, but he, he was operating in that cultural context. So yeah, there's all sorts of ways that you could say that these texts, they don't refer to same-sex loving relationships the way we know today same-sex loving relationships. There was no concept of that in the ancient world. It just didn't exist. And where it did, it wasn't recognized by the state. It was sort of underground. And, and so, yeah, there's, there's big, big differences. On the other hand, I do think that there is a sort of a surface level interpretation of those texts which clearly indicate that same-sex sex is not okay with God. Like that's, I don't see how you get around it really. Well, uh, I'm kind of curious. Uh, one of the apologetic arguments uh, about the Old Testament and whatnot is that you can break up the Levitical and 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 uh, the laws contained in Deuteronomy. You can break them up into three different categories. Uh, one is cultural. One is, uh, I guess, divine or whatever, or from God. And then I can't remember the third one. Um, that one always escapes me, but I know that they break them up into three. I'm kind of wondering what are your thoughts on, on that particular apologetic? Because you know, like, like like they contain the the homosexual, um, the anti-homosexual verses to be part of God's divine law instead of like a cultural law. Yeah, I mean, I think there are nuances to be explored there. Um, my tradition always talked about the Mosaic law which was like the Ten Commandments. I mean, here's the thing. Every Christian wants to preserve a portion of the Old Testament. So the question is, how do you determine which part of the Old Testament you're going to preserve and which part you're going to get rid of? So there are, you know, texts in the Old Testament which Christians interpret as foreshadowing Jesus. And those texts, since now Jesus has come, according to the New Testament, we don't need those anymore because we have Jesus instead. So it's sort of like the shadow is in the Old Testament, and then in the New Testament we have the actual thing. So you don't need the shadow if you have the actual thing. Um, then there are the cultic, ritualistic. Um, by cultic, I don't mean like Jim Jones. I mean like um, religious ritual um, laws about purity and, and cleanliness and... Um, and uh, stuff like that. So traditionally Christians group those into cultural uh, laws. Um, the problem is that often these laws are all mixed up together. So on, on, you know, in one passage you have this amazing text, say in Deuteronomy, which um, pro-immigration rights people, Christians, use to say we should be loving and accepting of our immigrant neighbors. You know, the text says, you know, love the, the, the immigrant or the stranger that's within your, your uh, boundaries because you were once a stranger in someone else's boundaries and you know what it's like to be an immigrant in somebody else's country, so you should uh, be understanding and compassionate to them. And then, you know, just in the same text, there's some other weird stuff that we would not want anybody to... Um, uh, sorry, my dog is uh, playing with the squeaky toy. Uh, <laughs> we, we wouldn't want uh, you know anybody following those texts. So the, to separate them out is sort of like you know unweaving a sweater in a, in a way. Like you've got to then then it becomes very difficult to create a hermeneutic that accounts for each of those uh, types of of law. It, believe me, it's been done. I mean, there are books written about it and. Um, Adventists that I came from certainly taught that because they wanted to preserve the Sabbath and the Ten Commandments in which the Sabbath is first found. 
and the narrative components of the Old Testament without holding on to, um, you know, the capital punishment stuff and uh, some of the diet. Well, actually, Adventists do hold on to the dietary laws. Adventists follow uh, the Levitical dietary laws like Jews do and don't eat shellfish and pork and so forth. So it's a lot of picking and choosing, honestly. Okay. Well, uh, you know, speaking of uh, speaking of these um, uh, beliefs, and when I'm wondering if you could kind of give us a brief overview of you know the Seventh Day Advent, uh, Adventist beliefs, like how like like how they're unique uh, as opposed to what people generally think of uh, in Christianity. Yeah. So I mean, the first thing to say is that Seventh Day Adventists probably, well definitely have more in common with evangelical Christians than they have different. Um, even though the things that are different are pretty significantly different, so sometimes it's, you know, easy to forget that. But, you know, Seventh-day Adventists believe in, um, you know, the virgin birth of Jesus, his death and resurrection, and that his death and resurrection atones for sin, and that you can be saved if you accept Jesus as your Savior, that there's a literal heaven and a new earth that God's going to create the earth new and all that stuff that almost every Christian would believe in. Um, what happens in history around the early, well, the early part of the 19th century in New England, in the United States, uh, there's a religious revival known as the Second Great Awakening. And this religious revival sweeps across the, the, the region and there's a lot of fervor and energy and preaching and teaching and Bible study around the soon coming of Jesus. And this happens, you know, periodically in history. And so um, there's a revival spirit. The people that were once just sort of sleeping in the pews kind of wake up and they say, oh, Jesus is coming soon. We've got to get serious about our faith. And uh, a group of these serious Christians who thought Jesus was coming soon uh, became known as the Millerites because William Miller, who was just a farmer, not trained in, uh, in biblical languages or Bible study or anything like that. Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, he decided through his Bible study that um, Jesus was going to return to earth in October, tw on October 22, 1844. Um, and they had a a rock even. It's called Ascension Rock. It's in New England. I forget it. Upstate New York, I believe. And uh, all the Millerites in the area gathered and many of them were farmers and didn't harvest their crops. Uh, some were businesses and just shuttered their businesses and waited for Jesus to come the night of the 21st and into the morning of the 22nd, into the morning of the 23rd of, of October. And of course, um, not to spoil the ending, but Jesus didn't come uh, on that day. Darn. I know. I know. Uh, at least you're not left behind. <laughs> so, um, yeah, nobody wants Nicolas Cage as their pilot. I can tell you that right now. <laughs> That's for sure. So, uh, out of that, uh, what's known as the Great Disappointment, um, a lot of different groups, I know, a lot of different groups um, formed, uh, one of them was called the Shakers, who had a belief that sex, even within marriage, was evil and sinful. And uh, so you can imagine they only lasted one generation. Uh, and then out of that also came the Seventh-day Adventists and Seventh-day Baptists emerged out of that. And so they held on to this belief that Jesus was coming soon, that they had gotten something wrong, obviously, about the October 22 thing. Uh, 1844, but that they were generally right that Jesus was coming soon uh, and that we all had to, to remain vigilant in our um, faith. Along with that, there was this part of the Second Great Awakening uh, that was happening was uh, what's come to be known as Restorationism. Churches of Christ are, are another group of, of Restorationists, and they uh, the Restorationists were eager to look into the Bible and discover um, forgotten truths, forgotten teachings of the Bible that sort of lazy Christians had just let slip by. And one of those was the Sabbath, the, the Jewish Sabbath. And so a Seventh-day Adventist taught that the Sabbath was not changed to Sunday, that that was something the Catholic Church did uh, surreptitiously, even it, with evil intention, um, to usurp God's uh, holy law. 
and that um, the uh, the real Sabbath was on Saturday, Friday night to Saturday night. So Seventh Day Adventists come to be known as people who believe in the in the Seventh Day Sabbath as well as the soon coming of Jesus. Um, along another 50 years after, there's a period of time in which uh, there's a health reform emphasis. So um, Adventists generally have a big emphasis on healthful living. Many of them go beyond the Levitical teachings and are vegetarians. And, uh, and that comes from a belief about the, bo the body, the human body being the temple of God's spirit. So those are a few, a few things. Does it does, does that particular thing uh, the uh, you know going as far as being vegan basically does that have any roots in uh, Genesis because I know some apologists uh, like to say that we started out only eating like like vegetables basically only eating plants I'm kind of curious if that has any like like foundation in that understanding you know it's it's funny you'd think it would be more there is that explanation um, you know that there was no uh, it's sort of like a, a bookend kind of explanation. Like in the Garden of Eden, there were, there were people weren't killing animals to eat them because there was no death. And in the Earth Made New, when God makes everything perfect again, we won't be killing animals and eating them either. So eating animals is a kind of accommodation that God allows for in this in-between time. But the ideal is not to eat animals, um, to kill anything, to eat it. Uh, so there is that emphasis, but um, it's it's more... Oddly enough, it's more of a health emphasis. Um, there are some texts in the, in the New Testament that talk about um, taking care of your body temple and all of that. And it seems like that's what people latched onto more than um, more than caring for creation or not killing animals. Um, also, I think in the 20th century, the animal rights movement was identified with like leftist liberals, and we certainly didn't want to be identified with that. Um, so Adventists just steered clear of the whole animal rights angle on vegetarianism. <laughs> Same with environmentalism, actually. Like environmentalists are like dirty liberals too. So um, you'd think that you know Bible-believing Christians would be environmentalists almost by nature, um, because God created it and it's precious. And and uh, you'd think that Christians would just be naturally wired to take care of the planet, but. It just doesn't work out that way. Well, now, now, hold on. I know that we're going to be getting into this a little bit later, but many a politician have said that only God can affect our environment. So there you go. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, except that they would say that, you know, Adam and Eve affected the environment by sinning and everything started going to shit after that. So I don't, you know, I don't know. Like all it took was one bite of the apple and there were thorns and weeds and death and like everything started dying. So... I don't see how humans aren't affecting things. I don't. Yeah. I don't know. Well, you know, like personal responsibility is the watchword of conservatives until it becomes about like, well, and then. And yeah, uh, you know, actually, um, the uh, one thing that I find funny about uh, the 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 um, you know biting the apple and 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 how we blame you know everything on Eve basically is like the punishments that come afterwards because like like the snake had to like uh, it said eat dust um, and then and then the woman had to go through painful childbirth and then the man had to he had to eat or at least that's how I understand it I might be wrong but that's just that's that's how I read it yeah it's like toil like in other words the man had to like, it was going to be by the sweat of his brow that he would bring forth food from the ground. It wasn't going to be easy anymore. Okay. I mean, it's an, ex it's, it's an ancient explanation for why life is hard. Yeah. Like we pissed God off and we got thrown out of a beautiful garden and now life's hard and that's why. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so uh, getting back on track to our original part of the discussion here, um, uh, you know, before your experiment, you know, uh, in, in January um, uh, uh, 2014, uh, you know, did you have any preconceptions going into it? Like, you know, any preconceptions about atheists or atheism or, or just uh, any preconceptions uh, about the subject in, in general? Few, very few, but obviously some. And I think the typical uh, ones. For example, I remember early on, I 
I had the same uh, concept of like, I don't know that I will have enough confidence to be an atheist because I thought to be an atheist, I'm going to have to know that there's no God. I'm going to have to have some kind of, oh, there's my dog. <laughs> hey, everybody. Welcome to Oliver. Uh, this, is, this is Oliver. Hey, Oliver. Say hi to everybody. Um, so, yeah, I thought, you know, if I'm going to have to find evidence that there isn't a God, I don't know. I'm probably going to be an agnostic because I just don't think I can have that level of certainty. And then very quickly people, you know, clued me in that, you know, being an atheist just means that you don't believe that there is. There could be. Like, you don't know. Like, there's no way to prove that there isn't. Um, so I was like, oh, okay. Well, that's why it's so easy for people to be atheists, you know, because it's sort of a default position. Like, how can anybody know? Um, I also, I think I had been exposed, again, like a lot of people, to the well-known, the famous atheists, um, Christopher Hitchens, uh, Sam Harris, Richard Dawkins in particular. Um, and, you know, their arguments, uh, you know, I had, I had had a lot of theological training. And so, in particular, Richard Dawkins' book, The God Delusion, uh, struck me as very simplistic in its treatment of Christianity. And, and, and Hitch, too, like, I, would, I read their books when I was a pastor when they first came out. And my, honestly, my thought after reading them was, like, I agree with most of that. Like, I, I think I agree that uh, that type of Christianity is pretty uh, reprehensible. I, I'm, I'm not a Christian like that. Um, I don't believe um, that God is responsible for every bad thing that happens in the world. I don't... Um, think that God is like a puppeteer and we're marionettes and he's just pulling strings and we just kind of do whatever God says. I, uh, I, I had become quite liberal in my theology by that point. And so I, I was in this weird position of actually reading, especially God is not great and feeling like I agree with him. And then when, when I would come to these passages that I didn't agree with, it was like, oh, he's gone too far. Like he's just, he misses the fact that there are Christians like me. Um, I'm so curious now, like, I need to go back and reread that book. I haven't done that since, since this last year, um, but I'm curious how I would, I would feel about it now. So that was it. I mean, I knew that they were like the angry atheist meme, you know, I, I kind of had that. Not that I thought all atheists were like that, but I knew that there were atheists that were angry. And frankly, like, I was an angry Christian. Like, I... I was um, actively campaigning in favor of same-sex marriage against these right-wing nut jobs that were trying to, you know, take away people's right to get married. I was, I was as angry about politicians that were trying to put Ten Commandments in their public monuments. Like that stuff pissed me off too. Like I, I was, a, I was a champion of separation of church and state. So I, I think I was already frustrated not only with Christianity in general but with my own denomination for being so backwards in its understanding of human freedom and the right to ask questions and um, so at my church right before I resigned at my church we had just welcomed a transgendered woman uh, we had an atheist that was attending church fairly regularly with their partner uh, I had a Buddhist who was attending church with their sort of agnostic partner uh, they were like probably 10% of my church were agnostics. They didn't know what they believed, but they liked the community. So it was, and then there were the conservatives who thought I was going to hell. So it was just this big mix of people and um, not, so I had evolved to that place. But so I had this, but then I just thought atheists just have had a bad experience with religion. That's what it is. They've been exposed to fundamentalism and they didn't know that there was another way to be Christian. And so they became atheists. I guess that was sort of my simplistic stereotype okay um uh you know a lot of times when when i criticize uh the christian faith uh you know i, I get i get that that generalizing thing a, a lot and so really that just reminds me to be very specific about who i'm talking about and yeah. uh you, you know i think that, that with any conversation about about faith or whatnot you kind of do have to be specific about like well i mean this kind of group because you know it, just like just like in atheism you know in any other theism out there there's going to be people that feel different ways and they exhibit different things. Well, one thing that I usually like to say is that there's assholes in every single faith that's not restricted by by any of that. Um, but uh, um, 
Oh, uh, so what what were uh, some of the Christian emotions that were kind of expressed to you, like as you were going through this experiment, or or or, or any experiences that you had with Christians as you were, you know, uh, doing this experiment? Um, you know, in the beginning, people were shocked. Um, I didn't really warn very many people. Uh, the people who knew me best knew what my doubts were. They knew what my concerns were. Um, but other people um, were pretty surprised. I think there was a sense of betrayal. Um, I had represented uh, a progressive edge of my denomination and was a leader in that. And so I think the progressives that were sort of hanging on by their teeth sort of saying, well, you know, if Ryan is a pastor and his church is this way, maybe I can still be, uh, you know, a Christian or an Adventist as well. And then when I sort of said, well, I'm just going to put it on the top shelf for a year and just see what the world is like if I just forget about participating in all of that, people, I think, felt hurt, you know. Um, but I think they wanted to give me my space. I mean, there were a lot of people who don't know me who were just like internet trolls that said all kinds of stupid things. Um, I always find that there are like three types of, of comments on, on the internet. One is people who think what you're doing is amazing. Those are fun to read. Um, there are people who um, tell you that you're an idiot and, you know, I know I'm not, so that's not too bad. And th but then there are the people who give you these honest critique, and then th those are the ones that are like, oh, I got to really think about that. So, I mean, I had all of those, you know, the whole range. Um, when I came to the end of the year, and uh, I think people were also giving me space because they thought I might come around, and they didn't want to, like, get too hard on me because it might push me over the edge. So I think people were giving me space, hoping that I would, you know, get it out of my system and then, you know, come back to the church. Um, so when I didn't come back at the end of the year, then I think there was a new wave of, um, you know, articles in my denominational magazine saying that I must be deeply depressed or um, I just didn't understand this or that theological nuance. Otherwise, obviously, I wouldn't be an atheist. Um, all the way to people being just really awful. And I don't think I ever got any death threats. But short of that, you know, people hoping that I would suffer, like definitely that. Looking forward to me burning in hell, like, you know. Uh. I say, I, I just don't understand people like that, that look forward to seeing somebody burn in hell. It's like, I look forward to seeing you tortured for all of eternity because I'm that much of a psychopath and God loves me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that really is psychopathy. I mean, I don't see, like, enjoying the suffering even of an animal let alone a human being I just think is horrible like a horrible uh, thing to admit to especially in public <laughs> well you know a lot uh, there are some apologists out there I guess more they're more fundamentalist leaning but they they like to uh, rationalize it with the idea that you know them telling you oh you're gonna go and burn in hell and, and all this other stuff like like that is actually showing love uh, I mean what what would you say to an argument like that well I mean I was talking to actually not to be a total douchebag name dropper, but I was just talking to, to Penn Gillette about this the other day. We were um, interviewing him, or he was interviewing me, I don't remember which way it was, for the documentary, and he, he put this question to me. Um, he said, you know, if you, I mean, Penn's, Penn's an interesting guy about it. I mean, he says, if you have the key to eternal life, and you don't tell me about it, you're an asshole. Like, that's, that's awful. Like, if you have a pot of gold, and you know where I could find one and you don't tell me, like that's really, that's selfish and that's horrible. So, I mean, he actually, and I, I think that that's, I, I agree with that. Like I think if, if you are a Christian and you think that you have the formula to joy and happiness and love and eternal life, you owe it to the people around you to tell them about that. Otherwise, you don't really believe it, do you? Like. That, that would be an awful thing to do to leave people out of something that's so free and so like abundant and that you could all have it. Um, on the other hand, you know, he's saying like if, if atheists have uh, something similar, they ought to be as equally as evangelistic in their approach. Um, uh, so anyway, I have some, I have to think about that some more, but, but to your point, like I do think it's, it's natural 
for people who, who have good news, who think they have good news, to tell other people about it. It makes perfect sense to me. Well, I, 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 I agree uh, about, you know, being able to tell people, but I, I guess I just see it as more um, of, a, of a discussion of tact. Because, like, you know, I, I guess the, the people that I'm more referring to are, like, uh, the more fundamentalist ones that, that just scream and shout and hold signs and say that, oh, you're going to burn in hell. Because, like, like you, could, you, could, you could spin it like that. You could say, oh, you're going to burn in hell. Or, you know, you could be like, oh, well, you know, because you don't believe in God, you're not going to be able to go to heaven and then describing like heaven, like being positive about it. So there's like positive and right. negative. I see. I see what you mean. Yeah, totally. Like, I think it's a bad strategy. I mean, I think yelling at people in general is a bad strategy. <laughs> I don't think, I mean, unless someone's running into traffic and there's a car coming and like, you know, and you're like, stop, you know, like, I think that, that that's the only thing I could think of where you know, shouting at someone might actually be beneficial. I don't think telling someone that God loves them so much that if they don't accept his love, he's going to burn them alive. Like, I, it just, that's not, it's not a good message. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I'd have to say so. I, I mean, it, to me, it sounds more like a dictator, I guess. <laughs> yeah. the, the idea of spending eternity with that God is horrifying. Yeah, and you know, I've often heard uh, that that actually in the Bible, because because like if you, I know the very few questions uh, Christians that I've actually asked, like, well, what do you think? Uh, you know, heaven is like or whatnot. Uh, they don't really seem to pull from anything that's in the Bible. It's it's always in their own preconceptions of what like this perfect plane of existence would be like. But like, uh, as far as um, as far as I know, as far as I understand it, in, in the Bible it says that basically, you know, heaven is is you're basically a robot that just worships God the entire time and and whatnot. Uh, I, I mean, which, I mean, do you have anything to say about that, uh, you know, particular uh, subject? Uh, always. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, you know, the, you know, my upbringing in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, the way that we were taught was that um, the reason why we aren't in heaven yet is that we all have free choice and God wants as many people as possible to freely choose him and and then the end will come and God's people will go to heaven and that even in heaven we'll still have our free choice so when people say well then what's to say we won't do it all over again that we'll sin and everything will go to shit again uh, and the answer is well because we've all experienced the results of sin nobody would nobody would ever want to go down that road again and so we'll live forever in peace and harmony um, which, you know, that's, I mean, that's a roll of the dice, in my opinion. It was a roll of the dice in the first place, right, that Adam and Eve wouldn't sin. Um, and so now you're going to roll the dice again, only not with two people, but with potentially millions of people. Um, and then my problem with heaven was always that I like, you know, my life and I assume most people's lives uh, are meaningful to the degree that we are experiencing something new or or I like to say solving a problem so like hunger is a problem and cooking and eating is a way to solve that problem um, exposure to the elements is a problem uh, poverty is a problem and so we work and we build homes and we take care of our lives to live and th that gives us meaning like work meaningful work um, but if you're planted in a world in which there are no problems there's no entropy, like nothing's falling apart, nothing ever needs to be fixed, nobody's ever mad at anybody, there's never any conflict. I mean, it just sounds boring to me. Like, I don't know what will we do with our time. Um, especially if, if you have eternity, you know, maybe the first million years you could spend like exploring things that you didn't know existed, but after that, like, what are you gonna do? And, and I agree with you, there really isn't any de detail in the Bible um, and the reason for that is that the Bible is really not that clear of, that there is heaven. I mean, there's a few places where Paul talks about the heavens, but this had more to do with the Roman conception of the cosmology, that there were layers of, of the cosmos that, that Paul inherited from the Greeks and the Romans, and, and Plato, who postulated that there was this ideal realm 
uh, based off of which like all of this exists. So there's the ideal world, and then we exist sort of as the shadows of that world. And, and so this is, I mean, I, the idea of heaven and perfection and living in a perfect world has a lot more to do with Greek and Roman philosophy layered over the top of some kind of, you know, reformed Judaism than really uh, anything that the Jews ever cooked up. Like, I don't, you know, the Jews are still of split opinion about whether there is even an afterlife. Uh you know, going back to uh, what you said about uh, you know how people are when they get up in heaven and how it's sinless and but there's still free will. Um, I feel like that kind of negates uh, including like sociopaths and psychopaths and whatnot in it because like take sociopaths for example. I mean they don't like they don't take joy in hurting people, but it doesn't mean anything to them. It's like they're they're lacking an empathy module in their brain. Uh, yeah. So, so you know, it, it kind of seems like to me, uh, if a sociopath were to abide by Christianity um, and and get into heaven, uh, it seems like he would be changed uh, it, to have this empathy thing, and so it doesn't really seem like he would be you know that person anymore. Right. So you, I mean, definitely the way the Bible talks about heaven is that you are transformed. I mean, you're perfected. You don't go to heaven with your sinful body or your sinful mind, or your, you know, your messed up whatever, like if you're, you know, if you were born without an arm, or if you uh, had a mental disorder, or if you had cancer, or whatever, like when you're resurrected, you're perfect, like you, you have no flaws anymore, so, so that part is taken away, so there would not be any psychopaths or sociopaths in heaven, they would be the same person if they didn't have that mental illness, basically. Like if you could take a really mentally sick person who could do really horrible things, not because they want to, but just because that's what their brain's telling them to do, and fix their brain like magically, that's the person, you know, that would go to heaven. So, Well, I, I have to... Uh, I was just going to say that, yeah, you know, exp explaining it by magic is sounds exactly like the Bible. <laughs> Um, um, you had kind of said that you had run out of reasons to really justify like a belief in Christianity. Um, I, I'm kind of curious what led you up to running out of those reasons, like like uh, if you know what I mean. Yeah, um, I think a couple of things. Um, I had how to how to say this. Um, I think I, I came to the point where I thought the universe was not a just place. Um, and more than just the, to be more specific, that, the, that humanity was not fair and just. And, um, you know, my Christianity had been based on the hope that God would one day put everything to rights, you know, that all the wrongs in the world would be righted, that evil would be eradicated, which, yes, requires destroying some things. But it's sort of like destroying Hitler. Like nobody's going to lose any sleep over that, you know, because the harm that Hitler did is far outweighs, I mean, anybody would kill him that had the chance, that had their head on straight. So that, that kind of thing, like God's going to get rid of the Hitlers and we're all going to be, everything's going to be good again. Um, and I just experienced so much um, suffering and pain in the world as I looked around and traveled and talked to people that I just, I think the, 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 the problem of evil began to wear on me a lot. I had, um, I can mark one specific moment. I was in a delegation, a peace delegation, and we were visiting um, Ciudad Juarez. This was in 2011 or, no, 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 2012, I guess. And the, uh, Ciudad Juarez had been the deadliest city in the plant, on the planet for three years in a row from 2000. 9 to 2011 or 2008 to 2010 somewhere somewhere like that and uh, because of the drug cartels and the guns being trafficked over the Mexican border and uh, police corruption and uh, the drug trade marijuana coming across the border um, Ciudad Juarez had become a war zone I mean worse than a war zone because it was um, civilians being killed just with impunity for no reason other than to just cast fear in the hearts and minds of everyone. Journalists couldn't even investigate crimes anymore. They would be 
killed mercilessly. People's heads would be left on stakes in the city. And it was, it was horrible. It was the worst place, worse than Fallujah, worse than, you know, Tikrit. You know, it was, it was the worst city in the world. And we were there at the tail end of that. It was getting, starting to get better in Juarez. And we were there as a group of Christians mostly that were investigating sort of the reasons for the, for the crisis, what humanitarians and activists could do to make a difference. And we had interviewed a bunch of people in Juarez. We had interviewed a bunch of people in El Paso, which is right on the border. And uh, one, the night that we left Juarez to go back to El Paso, we had talked to these families that had lost everything. It was one of those horrible massacres that made the international news in 2010. Um, these families, a group of them that lived on one street, had all sort of had a block party together, somebody's birthday or graduation, one of the two, I can't remember. And all these families were like, and you can imagine Mexican families, you know, together having a party. It was like food and music and celebration and dancing. Everybody's having an amazing time. And these gunmen blocked the ends of the streets with their big and they just shot the place up because they thought the guy they were looking for was there. And it turned out he wasn't there at all. But in the end, like 14 people were killed, most of them under the age of 20. And it was just, I, we were taught. That's, uh, okay. There we go. We're back. <laughs> so sorry about that, everybody watching. I hope you didn't just you know click away and, and leave us. Um, uh, but they, to, they went to the fridge to get a beer. That's all. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, uh, no, I, I'm kind of curious uh, just to move on with the the discussion here. Um, you know, what is it like uh, for you? You know, looking back after coming out of of you know, Christianity, and now you're an atheist. Like, what's that dynamic like between who you were before and who you are now? Is there any, like, big differences? You know, there's not... It's, it's interesting. Uh, I've thought about that a lot. I think there's more that's the same than that's different. Um, I'm still a person who cares very much about justice and peace and equality in the world. Um, I'm still very passionate about um, social change. Um, I'm still a father to my children. I'm still a friend to my friends. I'm, um, so the core of who I am, I don't, I don't think is, is really that different. And I think that really, that speaks to, to the fact that I think belief is, is just that it's a belief. Um, it's not the core of who you are. Um, and clearly our beliefs can affect our behavior and do affect our behavior, make us do things or not do things that we would otherwise, you know, do or not do. But, um, but I don't think that a Christian is fundamentally different, you know, at the core of the, who they are than a Muslim, say. Like, I think I grew up in the Cold War and... You know, I remember the day that it dawned on me that like Russian families, Soviet families love their children the same as my folks love me. Like they're just people with families trying to make a living. So I don't know. All that to say, I, I don't think that there's that much that's different about me. I think I'm, you know, the things that are different, uh, I feel more freedom. I feel more, um, I would say, less uh, afraid or guilty about things that are, I shouldn't be worried about, I don't think. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's it's mostly positive uh, changes. That's good. Uh, I know recently on um, the Atheist Experience, uh, you know, when you were on there, you had yeah. said that, that you really felt like uh, a great weight kind of had been lifted because, you know, in your mind, you were really trying to reconcile the Bible with, uh, you know, reality as you know it now. Um, so I'm wondering, how, how, can, can you explain a, a little bit more about that? Like, like what you were wrestling with in particular, if there was any in particular thing that you, that you were? Yeah. I mean, I think just the more, um, life that I lived and the more experiences that I had and things that I read and learned about, um, you know, things like um, homosexuality or evolution that didn't fit within my tradition of Christianity. Um, 
which I had just been holding those questions, especially evolution. Like I'd really just been holding those questions over here, like, and trying to focus on the stuff that I could be positive about and just kind of put the stuff that I was like, yeah, it's probably in conflict with my faith. And as a pastor, my concern was helping my members make sense out of their crazy lives and live lives full of meaning and contribute to society in positive ways. I mean, it really wasn't relevant to us whether the earth was 6,000 year, years old or, you know, four point something billion years old. It just, at the end of the day, it didn't matter to us. We were like, you know, what about people who can't afford their rent? Like that, or what about people who are hungry or homeless in our city? You know, that's, that's what we're concerned about. So I think that effort to kind of bracket those issues and not kind of think about them too much or to, to go to pastor's meetings where everybody's affirming things about theology that I'm just like rolling my eyes and thinking, I can't, I can't affirm that, but I have to pretend like I do so that I can keep doing the thing I love, which is ministering to my congregation. That tension, you know, was just tiring, you know, and, and I would also get called into the, to my boss's office and made to like try to explain how I was legitimate and, you know, if you had to, you know, justify your existence every six months or so, I mean, that's just tiring. And um, so that, that whole burden of trying to be Adventist, like I had to, I knew in my heart that I wasn't Adventist anymore, but I was trying to explain how actually I really was still Adventist. And that gets harder and harder, you know, as time went by for me. Um, and so imagine, you know, coming to the end of that and going, oh, I'm, I'm just not Adventist. That's much easier, you know. That's a much easier thing to get my head around. Yeah. Um, so it was the, a relief. The, yeah, that that seems like it would be very stressful to have to go in and justify your, you know, your 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 position every few months or so. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, the the. <laughs> uh, I mean, like. like I don't know. Say I have uh, midpoint reviews and whatnot at where I work, but I don't feel like it's me justifying. It's me, you know, it's my boss reviewing my work and being more positive and trying to make me better. Not like, are you, are you sure you want to be a pastor? Do you think you belong here? <laughs> right. Yeah. We uh, kind of think they really don't like this job. And no matter how many times you tell them that you really like the job, they're like, yeah, no, we don't really think you do. <laughs> You're like, what am I going to have to do to convince you I really like this job? Uh, well, to kind of uh, shift the discussion, uh, you know, outside of that and more into the current um, current atmosphere, I guess, in the United States. Um, how do you feel about uh, Christians, you know, trying to push religion on you? Because, like, like just uh, I, I was watching the uh, atheist experience and the very first caller was like, oh, well, then you're a Christian. Yeah, even though you have blatantly said, you know, no, I don't, I don't, I'm not Christian. I'm an atheist. Uh, you know, how, how, do, how do you, how do you feel about those that try to do that? I mean, it's just, it's disrespectful. I mean, I'm not easily offended. I'm, I'm pretty surprised. I mean, the internet attracts people who just love to get offended about everything. I'm, I'm really not that easily offended. You could pretty much call me whatever you want to call me. I don't, you know. At the end of the day, if I don't know you personally, I can just turn off my computer and go to sleep. But um, so yeah, he, I, I, to be honest with you, that first caller kind of threw me off, and I'm really glad Russell was leading it, and I'm really surprised Russell let him go as long as he did. Um, he was he had a very nice disposition and attitude, like he wasn't like angry or like you know you know kind of uh, attacking. But I just didn't know what he was trying to say, honestly. I just didn't. I was. I kept looking at Russell like, I don't, I really don't know what his point is. I just kept wanting to say like, what do you, just tell me what you're trying. I felt like he was trying to walk me down a path that or into a corner. And I was like, dude, just tell me what you think I am or that you're trying to tell me just like level with me here. Like, I don't, I'm confused by your little rabbit trail. So I guess he was trying to say that really I was still a, a Christian. Um, and I, I, to be honest with you, I don't know what he was trying to say. 
<laughs> well, you know, th this this actually does kind of uh, uh, you know uh, border on another important subject of this uh, nuns category that's really growing in our society, and you know, yeah. it, it's 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 people that have left a sh more structured religion and is into sort of not really affiliating, but you know, the, a lot of them most times are still they still consider themselves Christian because they believe in a Christian God. Um, I, I'm kind of curious, what are your thoughts on this growing nun? community. Yeah, it's, I think this is the future of, of research, sociological research for sure, around religion in America. Um, that group's going to get bigger, would be my prediction. And we don't we know next to nothing about that group, really. Uh, to group them together as nuns is sort of like to say Christians. You know, it's like, well, to say like X number of Americans are Christians really doesn't tell you very much. They could be Catholics, they could be liberals who are you know, as liberal as anybody could be politically, or they could be fundamentalist Baptists that want to institute some kind of Christian theocracy. So, you know, to say Christian really doesn't tell you very much, and I think to say none really doesn't tell you very much, as, as you pointed out. Um, but it is, it is the leading edge of what's happening religiously, if we can use that word, you know, in America. I think what scares people is naturalism. Um, that's that's the scary piece because to embrace naturalism is to say this is it like what you see around you and if you had a strong enough microscope what you could see and if you had a strong enough telescope all that you could see like all that that's it there's nothing else supernatural it's just natural stuff that that really rules out the kind of Deepak Chopra Oprah Winfrey kind of, but we believe in an energy that connects us all, or that if we think positively that we can manifest good things in our lives. I mean, I do think if you're positive, you're more likely to have the type of attitude which will give you the, the personal gumption to pursue you know, good things in your life than if you just sit on the couch and, and, and cry and say that you're worthless, then probably you're going to have of that kind of an outcome. But to say that something external to you shifts in the universe because you had a positive thought, to me is more ridiculous than actually believing in the Holy Spirit or Jesus or any of that, any of that stuff. So some people are like, why didn't you just become spiritual but not religious? And my answer to that usually is because that stuff seems more absurd to me. I would sooner be a Christian than to believe that there is a cosmic energy that's sort of like it just seems silly to me. I don't, I, and, and I'm not, you know, uh, you know, not everybody agrees with me. Like people think that that's not silly. They think that that makes the absolute sense to them. And this is, this is the other thing that, that I've really realized this year is that people are really different. And what seems obvious to you and so rational and clear and just so obvious to another person just is not obvious at all. It's fascinating. It's, uh, you know, we, we want to call people delusional who, who think that way. They probably want to call me, me delusional. Um, I was debating this guy on Facebook yesterday. I mean, debating is putting it a little too uh, energetically. Like, I, I responded in horror to what he said and then backed off because I just couldn't deal with it. But he basically was saying that he's a, a convert to Judaism and Orthodox Judaism, I don't, I don't think he's culturally or ethnically Jewish, um, but he was saying it makes sense that Arabs would hate Jews because Jews think they have a, uh, Arabs think they have a right to the land, Jews think they, they have a right to the land, and up to that point I'm like, yeah, okay, that makes sense. And then he said, um, and anyway, uh, Arabs and people, people with lower IQ like blacks and Arabs uh, are fond of conspiracy theories. And I was okay. like, uh, could, could you be more racist, please? <laughs> I was like, you may want to like think about that again. The irony was that he was the one espousing a conspiracy theory, sort of. Like I was like, I don't know if you noticed the irony in your statement, but anyway. Um, so I challenged him, and he's like, no, racism doesn't even exist. It's a stupid, made-up idea. There is no, there are no racists. It's just people who have their in-group loyalties and they're hostile towards other people who have their in-group loyalties. And, and actually, I, I think that's a fine description of the world. And 
except he was sort of celebrating it. He was like, yeah, we Jews have our in-group loyalties, and of course the Arabs hate us, as it should be. And I was like, I was really <laughs> like struggling with this. Like, you, sir, and I, again, I am the, I strive to be the most polite internet guy or podcast guy. Like, I, I really don't call people names. I just, it's not in me to call people names. But I said to him, sir, you are delusional. Because it seemed to me that he was living in an alternative reality <laughs> in which race-based hostility was not only acceptable but good. And I thought, no, that's like literally, so he's like, how dare you call me names? And I wrote back and I was like, I'm not calling you a name. I'm actually saying I think you're delusional. Like I, that's not, I'm, not, I'm not calling you a name. I'm just saying this is literally what I think is happening to you in this situation. Like you've surrounded yourself with people that reinforce this crazy idea that you have that blacks and Arabs and whoever else you might want to lump into that group are like at the level of their DNA inferior in some way to you. I mean, it's the most bald-faced racism I've ever encountered in my life. I mean, I've been told that there are racists like that out there. Um, mostly what we're dealing with nowadays is implicit bias and sort of subterranean forms of racism, but that was, like, scary to me. Yeah. So, I, you know, I say all that to say, like, people are so different. They, they really have a way... Uh, you know, as Jonathan uh, Hecht says in uh, Hate says in his book *The Righteous Mind*, you know, people come up with their ideas and then they uh, assemble the evidence. Sometimes it's actual evidence, sometimes it's other stuff, to support what they've already decided they believe. And so it's very hard to get people to change their minds really about anything. Well, just to add my own two cents in on this. Um with, with with his uh, you know description of what racism really is, uh, I, I I lean towards you. I, I do agree with that assessment of it, but I think racism is like just a more specific like description of it because it's like uh, it's not it's not so much in group loyalty or whatnot, but but like racism is, is labeling somebody a certain way based on arbitrary you know characteristics it, with racism it's it's their race and you know that's an arbitrary characteristic uh, so uh, um, you, you know I, I would say that it's a more specific version uh, I guess of what he was saying but uh, I think it's it, it, it's it's pretty delusional as you said <laughs> for him to just be like yeah racism doesn't exist <laughs> well he you know what he, I think what he means is that um, you know, racism is saying that there are these biological differences between races. And, um, and he, I think he's saying that, yes, that's true. And the ism is a smokescreen. And I mean, so he's like exhibit A. I mean, he's, he's, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he's the platonic, the prototypical atheist. I mean, atheist, racist. Yeah. <laughs> Um, well, to, to uh, I guess, actually kind of shift gears uh, along the same path here, uh, how do you feel about these religious freedom bills that have been kind of passing? Because a lot of them, a, a lot of them are reminiscent of the civil rights uh, movement, like in, in them wanting to discriminate based on an arbitrary thing, like, in, you know, in the civil rights, it was skin color. Now it's, you know, sexuality. Uh, I'm kind of curious, you know, what, what are your thoughts on those? I, I know I linked you a couple. I don't know if you got a chance to uh, read them, but uh, what are your thoughts? Oh, man. I mean, everybody wants to, you know, uh, tip, the, tip the board in their direction, you know. I, I just, to me, the idea of using a concept like freedom to give yourself an advantage over other people is the opposite of freedom. I, I just, I just don't, I mean, what I think is happening is, and I'm certainly no genius to come up with this. I mean, other people are, are saying this, but Christians in this country are losing market share. And it's, it's not just Christianity. It's men. It's, it's white people. Like the, the nation is pluralizing. Uh, there are more people from everywhere else here 
Uh, and we could, you know, talk about whether we think that's a good thing or a bad thing. It really doesn't matter whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. It's just a thing. And, um, and as that happens, the people who have been in the majority, that have been in the dominant position, have their dominance reduced uh, in politics, in, in commerce, in religion, uh, in the public square generally. And their kids are going to school with kids that are gay gay or the parents of their kids friends are gay or they're going to school with a, a Pakistani kid who goes to the mosque on Friday instead of church on Sunday or the Jewish kid who observes Hanukkah and, and Passover instead of Christmas and Easter so you know we have to share I and mean, this is this is the thing like I always tell people like my mom told, told me taught me when I was growing up that sharing was a virtue and What's happening now in our country, I think, is that people in the dominant class, and there's lots of different ways to describe who those dominant class people are, have to share. And uh, part of that sharing is that Christians have to share the world with people who are not Christian, um, and some who are not anything, not religious at all. And what do they do? They otherize those people, they vilify them, they turn them into monstrous others who are going to, we joke about eat our babies, but like, but like one step short of that, like corrupt your children, turn them gay, uh, turn them into atheists, corrupt their minds with science and evolution and all that. And these narratives sound absurd to us, but they're quite effective. Um, you know, it's it, before it was the communists are coming to get you. Um, the Red Scare, and now it's, you know, the, the non-believers, the atheists, the Muslims are coming to get you. You know, it's, it's always someone who's new on the block, who's the, the victim, the villain, you know, who's now, you know, out to take away your freedom. And I just, the, the very definition of freedom is that we sacrifice a bit of our security and our personal wishes to accommodate the agency and presence and uh, uh, ideas of, of, of another group of people that otherwise we don't have a democracy, otherwise we don't have freedom. Like if, if I create a neighborhood where only people who are between 5'9 and 5'11 and weigh about between 140 and 160 pounds, they're the only people that can live in that neighborhood, well then then I've created a particular kind of society, but it's not freedom. Like that's something else, you know? So I don't know. I just, I just think people lose the grip on power and the impulse is to grab on tighter. And I think these free, religious freedom bills are the attempt of people. It's sort of the last gasp of Christian dominance in America grabbing on tighter to what they've had and what they've benefited from in the past in the hopes that they can stem the tide of change. And it's just not, it's not going to work. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, like, like, like just take, for instance, the Georgia bill that recently came up. Uh, you know, it has language in it that could potentially allow, you, you know, or protect uh, domestic abuse, uh, domestic abusers, as well as child abusers. Uh, I mean, do you think that those bills could be used in such a fashion? I mean, there's always the possibility that, that laws like that can be really abused. Um, uh, you know, I think one another example are our voter uh, ID laws. You know, where ostensibly they exist to prevent fraud, voter fraud. But I think it's fairly clear to to most, well, to me, that those are efforts to to silence. Uh, and, and take the vote away um, from a group of people uh, that are marginal. And so, yeah, I, I don't know very much about the Georgia law, but um, I, I, I think any time there is an attempt to um, sort of put in place a very privileged set of, of um laws, you know, laws that allow for, for certain privileges to, to 
uh, dominate in the society, then someone is going to get left behind. I mean, the question you really have to ask in any of these things is, who does this benefit and who's, who does it clearly not benefit? And there's almost always winners and losers in these things. Yeah, uh, I, I agree. And um, just for those of you watching, if you if you don't really know a lot about U.S. law, um, in U.S. law, that what they have is it's a lot of uh, uh, court case based law. So uh, basically, these laws right now at their face probably aren't discriminatory or anything like that, but they could be implemented later in a discriminatory fashion, which changes the nature of the law and actually makes them discriminatory. That's actually what happened with the uh, anti-sodomy laws that, that used to be on the books in like Texas and other states. Um, you know, they weren't like the wording in them was, was so general that it couldn't, you know, it wasn't targeting homosexuals or anything like that, but it, they were, they were, they were, um, you know, pushed, uh, or, 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 or enforced in a discriminatory fashion. And that actually changes like the law itself, like that changes the nature of the law. So if, uh, like, I know Michigan, uh, has actually passed their religious bill, um, and correct me if I'm wrong in the comments, but, uh, you know, they've actually passed it, uh, you know, and there's other states that are really trying hard to do it. And I, I, I'd, I think that if these do get passed, we're not actually going to abolish them until a lot of people either get hurt or, 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 you know, die actually. So, uh, I think that there's, there's that kind of threat, um, that kind of, that kind of goes with it. Um, uh, you know, kind of switching. Oh, go ahead. No, no, no. I was just agreeing with you. Okay. Um, uh, and, and you know, um, Rand Paul here recently has spouted some pretty dumbass things about vaccinations. Uh, I'm kind of curious. Uh, you know, if if uh, for those of you that don't know what he said, he said that you know, uh, basically, kids that have gotten vaccinations uh, ended up with profound uh, mental disorders and whatnot, and, and and that he's actually known people whose kids have gotten profound mental disorders. And uh, so I'm kind of curious, how do you feel about uh, people, uh, you know, in these positions, like these high-powered, I guess, uh, political positions that, that are very anti-science or, or in, in spreading, uh, you know, this type of thing? I mean, it seems to me like a gross form of malpractice. Um, I mean, to me, if you are a medical doctor, it means that you've got an education, you've passed some pretty strenuous tests, and you're accountable to a certain set of ethical standards such that the rest of us will now trust you with our bodies. And when you abuse that trust, we send you to jail or we take your license away at the very least and prevent you from hurting anybody else. So when, when I don't know, like politicians are, this, are, are not so different. Like we've entrusted them to not hurt us uh, and not lie to us. I mean, we, of course, we know that every politician is lying at some level, but um, I, I don't know. I just feel like it's, it's a kind of malpractice. What, what's surprising to me, actually, and I noticed this in my church life, if, if you were to take, so say like the middle of the road position is that, um, oh, this is going to suck because I don't have time to think of a good analogy, but let, let's, say, let's say the middle of the road position is that vaccines are overwhelmingly successful at preventing horrible diseases and they have side effects once in a while, like any medication has, right? So the extreme conservative view or this extreme, I don't even know if I want to call it conservative, but the extreme anti-vax position is that you're going to get these profound mental disorders. If a liberal, whatever the, the equally insane argument on the other side would be, which I can't even think of what that would be, my, my point is you can make as crazy an argument as you want on the conservative side and you'll be reelected. Like nobody will, like you can say that Obama's financial, uh, fiscal policy is socialist, even communist, and pretty soon we're all going to be, you know, uh, you know, goose stepping, you know, uh, to Stalinist, you know, kind of rhetoric, blah, 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 okay, whatever. And people will go, oh yeah, let's reelect that guy. But if you, but if you said, you know, that 
George, that, that a conservative politician was, you know, a fascist and was like, you know, you'd be run out of town. No, nobody would reelect you. Like, it just seems to me that the country skews conservative, it skews towards people who are afraid. And I think people prey, and I'm not saying liberals don't prey on people's fears as well, but, but I think this idea that uh, these liberals will just give your kid any pill and you as the parent need to be vigilant. And I, as your politician, will protect you from those liberal pill popping, you know, pharmaceutical endorsing uh, liberal politicians. It's just a way to get votes. I, I, I cannot believe that they actually believe that stuff. I just, I think they, they have to be, yeah, I don't know. Like some, some of them I do think, like Ted Cruz, I think, believes the crazy religious stuff that he says. Um, who's the guy who's the classic of... Uh, climate change denier. Uh, I think he really believes that the climate's not changing, you know. So, I mean, I think there are true believers among them. But I also think that people are just playing, being played by, by these politicians who are catering to their fear to get them to vote for them. It's, I mean, it's just, it's bizarre to me that people wouldn't be afraid that their kids are going to get measles. Yeah. But, but they're afraid that their kid's going to get some obscure one in a million some kind of side effect from the vaccine i just it doesn't it just doesn't make sense yeah and, and you know there, there's a lot of uh, uh facts to back up what you're saying here because like when in in my interview with uh Aaron raw and dan arl uh both of them you know decided uh you know pretty much the same sentiment that that politicians are are basically playing to their audience in order to get reelected. And, and the biggest case for that is actually george w bush because in his last uh in his last uh, uh you know uh, presidential term um uh, on his very last interview before he left office, he actually said that, you know, well, no, I lean more towards, you know, believing evolution is real and, and, and you know, subscribing to evolution. Uh, but, you know, prior, uh, you know, he had said, well, no, creationism and evolution, you know, belong in the same, in the same, uh, uh, you know, on the same level. And so, right. you know, and, and so, you know, he basically had nothing to lose there at the end. And he was just like, uh, yeah. Uh, you know, evolution. <laughs> so uh, I think that there's a lot of, of, of real facts behind this. And I think that, that, you know, we'll probably find out a whole lot more, uh, you know, with these politicians and, and what they actually believe and what they're actually using to pander to their audience. Um, so, I mean, and just to be fair to, to both sides, like at the beginning, Obama was against same-sex marriage. He thought marriage should be preserved as an institution between one man and one woman. And then, oh, all of a sudden, along about his second term, he said, ah, I changed my mind. You know, actually, I've come to a new insight about it. And now I think same-sex marriage is good. He, he didn't change his mind. He, I'm, I'm almost sure that he always believed that same-sex couples ought to have the same civil rights as everybody else. I would, I would bet serious money that he always thought that. But he just couldn't get risk it in the first election saying stuff like that I think that he probably knows that you know part of the complexity of ISIS for example is Islam I think he he understands that religion plays a role in what we're seeing in Syria and Iraq he just you know politically and and maybe even security wise you know it isn't it isn't smart for him to, to say that you know, when he writes his memoir, when he's not president anymore, we're going to find out the truth. So it's, it's, it's very difficult to figure out what people actually think um, because they're just catering to what people are afraid of and what will allow them to get elected. Oh, yeah. Did you, no. ever, see, uh, did you ever see that movie, Bullworth? Uh, yes. I haven't, I haven't seen it in a while, so my, my memory is kind of fuzzy, but I do remember that. <laughs> well, yeah, that, the politician, I forget his name, who, what the actor's name right now, but he, he, uh, he's up for re-election and something happens where he's just positive he's lost it. Like, so he, he kind of just throws everything to the wind and just starts telling the truth about everything. And he starts doing, he did some drugs and he got drunk one night and the cameras caught him like totally wasted and like he just says honestly what he feels about things. 
and the public just goes crazy and they love him and they really, you know, it's, it's a hilarious comedy, but it was like, what would happen if a politician was just like, you know, honest about everything? And it's, it's pretty crazy. See, now I'm, now I'm just going to have to go and watch it again. <laughs> it's pretty great. It's pretty yeah. great. Um, but kind of, kind of staying on, on track with the, uh, you know, the religious part of going and to kind of round off the, uh, the interview, how do you feel about these politicians that are really trying to interject religion into government? Because, you know, like, uh, there was a Susan Atanas in Chicago that was, uh, you know, basically saying that God's wrath is upon the earth because of homosexuality and, and all this yeah. other stuff. And, and, you know, you, you just have a lot, like even Ted Cruz with, you know, his climate change denial has said that you know well only god can change you know the weather or whatnot um or environment um so i'm just kind of curious how, how do you feel about uh politicians really using religion i guess in order to get reelected or or trying yeah. to force that into government i mean i i think it's not only bad it's dangerous um i mean People have their certain people have their hand on some pretty powerful buttons that can you know do pretty horrible things to the planet. Um, wars have been started over less, you know. I, I so I think it's an escalation of rhetoric um, that's on one level probably just you know fodder for some late night comedy show. Um, at another level, it's it's worrisome, you know, if that's a trend. I kind of have faith in the American people that over the long run, they're not going to fall for that. Um, they'll see it for what it is. There's a part of me I've always wished that, uh, that we could live in two parallel universes and kind of pop back and forth between them. You know, like one where, the, where Ted Cruz is elected president and and one where like Hillary Clinton is elected president and we could actually do a side-by-side -side study we could solve it once and for all like this is what it would be like if Ted Cruz was president I mean of course none of us want to risk that possibility but imagine if you could like run that scenario out you know and see what it would be like and then everybody would go oh okay never mind you know like we don't want to go down that road but unfortunately, we don't get that luxury. You know, we don't we don't get that that opportunity. And the biggest concern is really climate. I think some scientists are saying we're past the, the point of no return, um, and if we're not, we're close to it. And it's uh, you know it's it's um, it's easy to put it off because all of us are going to die and go to our graves long before anything super catastrophic happens. But you know, if we have any concern at all about the people who come after us, it, it's. Uh, this kind of theocracy talk is just, you know, ignoring uh, what's what's right in front of us. I mean, I actually think it's probably more people's business interests uh, on the line. You know, the need for oil and the desire to just keep cranking oil out of the earth. Um, most of these Hollywood blockbusters that picture the end of the world, you know, it, it's always like some prophetic voice saying, "Hey, guys, we better stop." Otherwise, we're going to go right over the edge of the cliff and nobody listens to them because they've got money to make by doing some other thing. And then sure enough, we were like headed over the edge of the cliff. And then, of course, it's a Hollywood movie, so someone saves the day or, or whatever. But I, I just, I don't know. I think it's courting disaster. Um, it's short-sighted. Sometimes I think these politicians actually believe that God would punish the earth this way because in the Bible, God does that and... Um, Israel, for example, is taken off into captivity in Babylon, ostensibly because they've disobeyed God, and so God lets them be conquered by their enemies. Um, so, I mean, I think it's it's not far fetched for Christian theocrats to say, "Look, if we don't, we're not faithful to God, and you know, ban these evil homosexuals or whatever else, you know, evolutionists or whatever that." Uh, God will smite the earth with more natural disasters. And, you know, it's not climate change that's causing these natural disasters. It's actually God's curse upon our evilness. Like, I think it, it sounds far-fetched, but I think, you know, that case could be made. It's, a, it's an interpretation of the Bible. Let's put it mm -hmm. that way.
Well, uh, you know, the, the, the biggest uh, relation that I make as far as climate change goes and, and this argument that only God can affect our environment or whatnot is, you know, pointing out the, the lead in our gas, uh, you know, that we had. Um, because the, the guy that actually discovered the, you know, the age of the earth, he had to build a clean room and he had all this experience and, and really isolating things in, in, in that way. You know, and, 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 you know, he was able to prove that we were having a profound effect on our environment, uh, you know, with lead. And as soon as we got rid of the lead in products and gas and whatnot, you know, the, the lead concentration levels in our own health systems, you know, it, was, it went down a lot. And so, you know, that it, it's really hard for me to really grasp, you know, where, where these uh, politicians and other people are coming from when they say these things, because we've already shown that we can have an effect on our environment. And, and so that's, that's kind of where I get confused uh, about it. Yeah, it's, it's not, there's not really anyone who, well, I shouldn't say anyone, there's not a political consensus that's taking a long view and saying, let's put our self-interest aside for the moment, our business interests or whatever, and think about what's going to happen 100, 200, 500 years from now. Scientists are doing that. Lobby groups are doing that. Think tanks are doing that. But politicians are worried about like 18 months from now, you know, when I need to get reelected. And I just, I don't know how to bridge that gap. I feel like it's going to take something so obvious. You well, know, it's like, well, it's like smoking and then your doctor says you're going to get lung cancer and you're like, nah, I'm not going to get lung cancer. And then one day you get lung cancer and you're like, oh shit, I better stop smoking. Yeah. You know, and then you're just like, sorry, dude, like it's too late now. Like, you know, so I feel like it's going to take some horrible like wake up call. And then my concern is by then it's like, we just have to make the best of it, you know, and, and humans are ingenuous and I think, uh, we'll figure out a way for some of us to survive probably like, uh, you know, I, I kind of, again, I have a, a confidence in human ingenuity and creativity and entrepreneurial spirit that, you know, we're going to solve some problems that we think now are, are catastrophic. But I, I also think we could stop creating more problems <laughs> while we're at it. Yeah, we, we could, but, you know, we'd have to pull the politicians' heads out of their asses, and that seems to be like a uh, sword-in-the-stone kind of effort. <laughs> I don't uh, know why we keep re-electing these guys. I really don't. I just, I don't understand it. Well, okay, okay. On, on the subject of electing people that are clearly dipshits and shouldn't be in power, how do you feel about Klingenschmidt? Who? Do you know uh, uh, Klingen Schmidt? He's the um, he's he was like a a pastor or something that got elected uh, to a position in Denver, uh, and and he actually he's got this crazy show. Uh, and, and on one particular show, he actually tried to exercise the demons inhabiting Obama. I don't know much about. I can't hear you. I think you broke up. I don't know much about oh. this, actually. Oh crap! Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Well, he he uh, he's a crazy pastor that got elected to a uh, a, a government position in in Colorado, and he, at one point he actually tried to through the TV exercise the demons that were inhabiting uh, Obama. I did not hear about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he he's uh, he he's 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 really known around, I guess, uh, inter internet circles for being really crazy uh, and and this saying is, the whole. This bunch is what of stuff. I'm talking about. Like people will elect that guy, but if you say like you believe uh, that the scientific consensus is that we evolved over millions of years to be the people we are today, nobody will elect you. Like, or if you. I don't know, like, it's just, if you said, no, actually, uh, it's not demons that are invading uh, Barack Obama, it's um, smoochkins, you know, and they're, like, from a planet somewhere. I mean, if you just made up some stuff, like, people would be like, you're crazy. It's not that. It's demons, you know? <laughs> it's yeah. Like, 
<laughs> I'm just like, what? you could say the craziest thing and it just, people will, I don't know how you get votes. It, I, 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 well, I really the, don't understand it. Yeah, the, the way that I've kind of uh, compared it is um, religion in our society has really become a cloak of invisibility from like Harry Potter because like, you, you know, it, it, it works very well at hiding the crazies because the crazies, uh, you know, that they'll sometimes latch onto a religious idea and really get involved in it. And you really can't tell that they're crazy because of the social acceptability of religion. Um, and, and so I, I guess that's that that's kind of how I feel about about religion in general in America, uh, just being this cloak of invisibility and really shielding those people. Because I, I think that if, if if religion wasn't so socially acceptable, we would actually be able to identify people that could potentially be dangerous or or, you know, whatnot, because then we would look at them and be like, you're fucking crazy, dude. <laughs> I, I kind of think that the next generation will be easier to i mean i suppose we all, we always say that but when i think about my kids i mean they're not nearly as gullible as i was about all this stuff but again i live in southern california so what do i know <laughs> and and i pretty much live in the asshole of the bible built <laughs> Um, so, uh, you know, rounding off this interview here, I, I really appreciate you coming on, even though we had some technical issues. Uh, I, I, I really like talking with you, uh, Ryan. I hope you'll join me in the future. Um, and uh, would you like to tell people about what you're doing uh, this year or, or in the future in general yeah. and, you know, where people can find you? Yeah. Um, so I, I write fairly frequently at my blog, yearwithoutgod.com, uh, which is part of the Pathios uh, family. I, I blog on the Atheist channel there, yearwithoutgod.com. And then um, there are two guys that are working on a film, uh, a documentary about my year. And uh, you can find out more about that at yearwithoutgodfilm.com. Um, we had a successful Indiegogo campaign and uh, the project is entering into the post-production phase now. And so I'm as eager as anybody to see what happens with it. So um, yeah, so we got a lot of great interviews with a lot of interesting people. If you go to yearwithoutgodfilm.com, um, you can see a couple of trailers, like snippets of the film, and some, a list of, of of like people that are involved in it. And um, yeah, it's just been great. So I'm doing a lot. I'm traveling and speaking a lot now. I'm um, I'm in Santa Barbara tomorrow uh, for the Humanist Society of Santa Barbara, and then in a couple of weeks, I'm uh, well. Next weekend, I'm in in Phoenix. Uh, no, is it next weekend? One of these days I'm going to speak at Sunday Assembly in Phoenix and then later Sunday, Sunday Assembly in Vegas. Um, so anyway, if all that's on my website uh, under the events tab, uh, the places that I'm going to be. We love, love to see people whenever I'm in town. And um, I'm working on a book and um, my day job at PATH, People Assisting the Homeless. Um, if you want to help us uh, end homelessness, uh, you can find us at epath.org. And um, yeah, so that, that's, that keeps me more than busy. Yeah, I can imagine. I, I, I um, you know, when I was watching the Thinking Atheist podcast, I heard you mention the, the homeless, uh, you, you know, uh, stuff that you do. And uh, I really want to commend you for, for uh, you know, doing that. Um, you know, I, I wish I had more of the resources and more of the time to, to actually, you know, uh, do a lot more around my community. But I'm pretty, uh, I'm pretty stretched thin as is with my job and everything. So I, I really commend you for, for, for really uh, going in that direction. Um, well, I'm fortunate, you know, I'm fortunate to have a job that allows me to give back while I'm also making a living. And, um, it's a great organization to work for. Um, they've been around for 30 years, so they, they know what they're doing. You know, they know what they're doing, and uh, I feel really confident about the efforts that we're making here in Los Angeles. I mean, there are over 50,000 homeless people in Los Angeles alone in the county, so uh, we have a lot of work to do there. And it's just not right for people to be just left on the street. Some people, you know, maybe make their own choices, but most people don't choose to live on the streets and. Uh, so it's it's a privilege to be able to work at an organization that can help out in that way. Awesome. Um, well, uh, that's uh, it for this interview, guys. Uh, again, uh, Ryan, I really appreciate you coming on here and talking with me. Um, and. 
And uh, I hope that in the future, you know, of course, you'll join me for some more uh, topics that aren't related to your religious background that you've repeated about 20 times by now. <laughs> um, That's okay. Yeah, and everybody uh, watching this uh, now or in the future, I highly suggest you keep up with uh, Ryan's blog, A Year Without God, on, pa on Patheos. Uh, he's got some really great articles, and 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 you know he 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 just writes really well. Um, so I, I highly suggest you go in there and hit the newsletter. Uh, email subscription box and and everything and and uh, just keep a lookout for him. And um, <clears throat> Ryan, do you have uh, any any parting words you want to leave with? No, just uh, stay curious. You know, it's uh, I think uh, we live in a wonderful wonderful world, and we get a short little time here. We just got to make the best of it. So I'm happy to be part of a a loose network of communities that are thinking critically and trying to make the world a better place. So thanks for having me a part of your show and and uh, we'll see you down the road. All right, that sounds awesome. And everybody watching now, have a good weekend, night, day, whatever. And as always, don't forget to think skeptically and stay godless. Thanks, John. <laughs>